recording. All right, let's start again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jason. Right. So, yep, no continue. problem. Okay, so I think we just finished with that slide that the EJX and EJA series. So today our offering kind of looks like this. We have our EJX series and our EJA. Uh, the difference, main difference there being the accuracy, you can see the uh, X has a 0.04. Uh, percent accuracy where the A has a 0.055 percent accuracy and then we also uh, have some differences on the stability ratings that we have on these transmitters a 15-year stability guarantee on the a X series and a 10-year on the A now um, we not only offer our differential pressure but gauge absolute as well we do offer our 910 series of multivariable transmitters for uh, things like uh, gas flow using orifice plates um, different things of that nature a traditional mount and inline mount offered, um, you know, for all your different applications. Then we have a number of different accessories that we can put on our transmitters as well, whether it's a manifold, we have the remote diaphragm seals. Um, we can also do a number of different compensating capillaries for very difficult applications. Our digital remote sensors, if it doesn't work where you've got a capillary outside, uh, we can do two transmitters tied together um, via a mod bus and then sending out on, a, on an analog output. And then we can also do some integral orifice place and, and pitot tube assemblies uh, with our multivariable transmitters. So we're looking at our DP harp technology. We talked a little bit about the fact that our competitors are using either capacitance or piezoresistive. So this is kind of an important one here. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on it. It's about how we really manufacture this and, and what it will mean for uh, our customers that use it. So this uh, silicone resonance sensor, we, we fabricate this from a single crystal silicone. We use a 3D micro machining uh, technique. So as you can see on here, two H-shaped resonators are patterned on this sensor and they're each operating all the time at a high frequency output. So as that pressure is applied from the bottom, these bridges are simultaneously stressed. So one is in compression and one is in tension. The resulting change in this frequency produces a high differential output. So that's directly proportional to our applied pressure. So it's a pretty much a simple time-based function that's managed by the microprocessor. And we can give a digital signal directly from the sensor without having to go through an ADD converter like a lot of our competitors will do. So what this is gonna mean for, uh, for you guys is this is gonna improve our overall accuracy of the transmitter. Even though it's small, there's still some probability of error in each stage of that conversion from A to D. So in the DP application, the microprocessor can also use two frequencies, these two frequencies to determine the static pressure. So this, uh, this for the sensor can measure not just differential pressure, but also um, static pressure as well. So it takes takes a couple minutes to like look at this slide, but I think it's important to stop there. Now, if we go to the next slide, we'll start talking about why being an active sensor is important. So when we look at being this active sensor, we talked about these two um, uh, resonators always resonating at their natural frequency. What that's gonna do is as the pressure is applied, we talked about the H-bar being in compression and tension. Uh, we take a take F1 minus F2, that's going to give our differential pressure. Well, because we're an active sensor and always working, we can also add those two frequencies together, which will give you a static pressure reading out. And because of the way the, the um, sensor is manufactured, they're two dissimilar materials. So we're able to uh, take the temperature reading at that kind of natural thermocouple that's, that is uh, developed by the way it's manufactured. So that's going to be important later. We're going to talk about some dynamically compensation. Uh, that we can do on these pressure transmitters. Next. So just real quick, kind of how we protect this chip. One of the ways is when you'll see in our traditional mount, you've got some of this diaphragm protection on the chip itself. So this is going to keep the process area away from uh, the sensing area, whether it's due to temperature isolation or pressure isolation. Next. So we talked about it being an active sensor. So what this is going to mean for our customers is that uh, all of these products are still two out of the box, kind of like a heartbeat uh, sensor, if you will. They're independent of uh, one another. So if one of those resonators fails, um, you're going to get a, a capsule error, which is going to immediately provide you that sil two rating that you know you've got a, a problem with your transmitter or something needs to do at that time. This also um, allows our customers to only have to stock one version because being sil two, we're not charging that as, a, as an extra add-on where you're having some transmitters that might be sil two and some are not. Next. Okay. Jason, you're doing great. Just letting you know, got about five minutes left, but keep it up. You're doing great. <laughs> I got about 50 slides. Um, <laughs> all right. So overpressurization. So this is something really cool that Yokogawa is the way we handle overpressurization. And so basically what will happen when we realize an overpressurization event, you can see the right hand picture at the top there. 
you've got basically four diaphragms. And as that fill fluid is pushed on the uh, high side, you can see there's a small dog leg that'll dump off that additional pressure, uh, fill fluid into that internal blue diaphragm. And as that pressure, um, overpressurization event subsides, the transmitter itself will come back within the plus or minus 0.03% of the upper range limit. So one thing I want to mention there is when you're looking at like a capacitance sensor, that sensor is very thin material, kind of like a Coke can. So if you crank that up on an overpressurization event, number one, you may damage and uh, ruin that transmitter as well as we will definitely have to go out and re-zero. So the possibility of you having to re-zero this transmitter on the overpressurization is not as much, but if you have to, we do have a, an easy set screw on the side that you can open up and, and um, turn till you get that zero. Next. Okay, so dynamically compensated, being the fact that the, we can have not just our DP reading, but also our static pressure and our temperature reading. Uh, these transmitters are characterized down in Noonan, Georgia, and this characterization curve is put into the transmitter itself. So if we're seeing any kind of line changes on the static pressure or the temperature of that capsule, Again, we're dynamically compensating for those uh, changes in process condition and giving you a nice, tight, accurate um, reading. So again, you don't have to go out and zero if all of a sudden your line pressure happens to be a little bit different than the transmitter was originally set up for. Go ahead. Speeding up here for you, Andrew. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so basically what this is going to mean on that dynamic compensation, you know, some ongoing maintenance and re-zeroing, that dynamic compensation is going to change the uh, ch handle those changes as well as the overpressurization. What this is going to allow you to do is to rely on your pressure products and rely on those uh, those points of measurement in your facility, not have to spend time on this particular instrument if on the maintenance side where you can go put your efforts and time and other things uh, within the plant that may need some uh, attention. Next. And then just to kind of round this up, the three things I was hoping you take away from this, again, we have our active sensor. We're still two out of the box. Uh, the, resonating, uh, the resonators are always moving. This helps us to dynamically compensate, and we handle overpressurization events um, really well. And next. And, of course, as I mentioned before, pressure is only one thing I do. I do a lot of different flow products and other things. So if something else comes up, Andrew knows how to get a hold of me, and we're more than happy to come out and see you and, and, and show you some demos. So I appreciate your time. I think I did how to do in my time, Andrew. You did. I'm giving you a round of applause. A real nice. pair. Wait. Thanks. All there right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. I'm going to mute now. So thank you very much, Jason. Yeah, the DP Harp Active Sensor is great for activities because it's an active sensor. Uh, you can do so much with it. You can do so much. So, Jason, thank you very much for, for going through all of those things. Uh, I just wanted to highlight just a couple of little things. Um, we, you can have one sensor for DP, and it also will give you a static reading, gives you a static output. Uh, and that same DP transmitter will give you a cell temperature output as well. So if you want to use a HIMHART module, if you want to extract more variables from your uh, pressure transmitter, we have that capa capability. So, and we, we're, we're hoping that these things we talk to you about just kind of have you just look in our way a little bit. I know some of you guys are using Yokogawa. Some of you guys use the vortex meters and the mags, um, you know, and we're, we're hoping to help you out. We, we got a lot of great stuff. I've honestly, I've never had a customer tell me they don't like Yokogawa's product. It's just a solid product. So thank you, Jason. Um, I, I'm just going to check the Q&A really quick. Let's see here. Um, what is the temperature range options with the diaphragm? Jason, do you know? So we're looking at the diaphragm. If you're talking about the diaphragm seals, I mean, quite frankly, they're all over the place, you know, so it, mm -hmm. we've got a number of different ranges. It's just going to be application dependent. If we're talking about the temperature range inside the capsule itself, uh, when we're talking about dynamically compensating, that temperature range is going to be specific to the temperature range of the transmitter. So Absolutely. hopefully that will help. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, he's referring to capsule temperature. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that capsule temperature, it's not necessarily a range. Oh, says that works. I think I got you. All right. Thanks. <laughs> cool. Thank you, guys. Back to mute. We have do, 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 do. one quick poll question. So, guys, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, what is the most important aspect of pressure measurement for you? Um, I'm going to. So everybody should have this on their screen. They should be able to click on it. I'm curious what you guys uh, are looking for. So I'm seeing three votes, five votes for repeatability. Um, repeatability and accuracy 
Uh, I know Jason mentioned the 15 year uh, spec, the 15 year, um, you know, we, we, we will be within spec for 15 years. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that that helps. Um, and this will help with, uh, with follow up with you guys. So there are the results. Um, and I'm glad our stuff looks cool. Thank you to whoever said that as well. So, okay, cool. So we have our next presenter. We are here to talk to you. Next up is Jason Felton from MSA regarding gas and flame detection. Uh, we're hoping you have some at the plant. Uh, I, I know that you guys have the Ultima X from us for some of your O2 measurement. And uh, we're here to talk to you about the new X5000. So, and the features that come with that. Jason Felton, if you are ready, my friend, it is your turn, take it away. Yeah, I am ready. Thank you, Andrew. So again, I am Jason Felton, the territory manager for the upper Midwest. And I think I've actually been in Oxable a few times in the past. So there's a few names on the attendees list that I do recognize. So hello to people that, that do recognize me. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, our infrared sensors versus catal catalytic bead sensors, and then how they fit into the Ultima X5000 platform. Next. Um, the agenda for my, my 15 minute increment, we're gonna talk about what were the first gas detectors, we're gonna review what a catalytic bead technology is, we're gonna look at what the point infrared sensors look like and how they operate, then we're gonna do a, a quick comparison and then we're gonna see how they fit into the X5000. Next, yep. Uh, so the first gas detectors, um, as, as you can see, well, let me just take it back. Uh, MSA is gonna be around for 107 years this year. Um, and short, and that was so we were established in 1914. You guys um, are in 1920, old. we, yeah, we <laughs> developed, in 1920, we developed the catalytic bead sensor. So the cat bead sensor has been around for about 101 years this year. Um, and with the invention of the catalytic bead sensor, that canary that you see, the proverbial canary in the coal mine has been out of work. Next. So when we're talking about LEL, de LEL de detection, um, we're gonna be, be looking at the LEL level, right? So when you look at the LEL in this particular case for methane, you can have a 100% by volume uh, of methane, but to be the combustible level, you only need 5% of that gas to reach the combustible levels. So I think if you hit next, there should be a, an animation, I believe. Uh huh. Yes. Yep. So, so that that yellow box that's on your screen is the area that where gas detectors are are monitoring and that's your LEL zone. So we're measuring that box in a zero to 100% scale. So then as you can see, methane is 5%, uh, propane is 2.1% but by volume, but all of those are measured in a zero to 100% scale. Okay, not, now you can move forward. Mm. Um, this, in a nutshell, is what a catalytic bead sensor is. As, as mentioned, it was developed in the, in the 1920s. Um, but what you, what you see here is really as a, a, a wheatstone bridge. So you have an, an active sensor and then you have a compensator or a, a reference sensor on, on the other side of the wheatstone bridge. The gas that comes in in contact oxidizes or burns um, on the analytical side and creates a resistance on that, that wheatstone bridge that's proportional to your LEL. Next. So about 10, 11 years ago, MSA bought a company called General Monitors. And the way everybody makes a catalytic bead sensor is the same in, in theory. Um, but on this new platform that we have for the X5000, um, there's actually been some in, in, improvements on the catalytic bead sensor. So usually these uh, reference beads or the, the, the analytical bead or the reference bead are, on the catalytic bead sensors are generally small and need a, a microscope to actually see them. Um, obviously, this is still a blown up, blown up picture of a of a of a sensor, but those beads are five times bigger than anybody else's on on the market. That gives us more surface area, more active areas to detect gas, um, so it gives us a longer lasting sensor. But because those beads are bigger and heavier, and those wires that you can barely see on the screen are about as thin as a strand of hair, they need support to hold them up. So now there's a, a, a support post 
and that support post acts as a heat sink. So now on this, this catalytic heat sensor that's been around for 100 years, now we have a better, longer lasting uh, catalytic heat sensor. So no drift, better resolution, um, and that's from that support post, and they have a longer lasting sensor because of the massive uh, surface space of those cat, uh, of the beads on the on the catalytic bead sensor. Next, um, and then this is probably what everybody's used to: an infrared sensor. This has been around probably in the gas detection world probably since uh, the 80s or 90s. Um, obviously, relatively new, um, but uh, we started. As you can see, we started developing this technology in the 50s, but it really wasn't taken off until, like I said, the 80s or 90s. Um, the way this sensor works, if you look at that small picture on the right, you can see an infrared source that bounces through or shines through the, the sapphire lens and then bounces off the, the mirror and then goes back and then we're looking at the, the delta between what light we emit to what we receive. So in, in between that sapphire window and the lens, that's where gas would, would come in and absorb some of that infrared light. And then that's what we're actually de detecting is that light absorption from that gas. You can go to the next one. So when we look at these side at these side by side, um, the catalytic bead sensor does have a, a lower initial cost. Um, the one time you do replace a catalytic bead sensor, you just pay for that cost of an infrared sensor. Um, catalytic bead sensors, as you can see, have a regular calibration versus the infrared sensor having less calibration. Um, so that means on a cat bead, you have maybe a three to six month calibration interval. And then on the infrared sensor, you have a one year calibration interval. Um, and you can see on the catalytic bead sensors, they can be affected by poisons such as silicones in the air, whereas infrared technology does not have any effect to it, to the poisons in the atmosphere. Um, because we're, the catalytic bead sensors are combusting or oxidizing the sensor on the, on the the, the catalyst of the beads, it needs oxygen to operate as an infrared sensor does not. Expected life of a cat bead sensor, um, this is a, a, a conservative estimate, but we're going to say five, five years. And then the life expectancy on an infrared sensor is 10 years, but no, we have a 10 year warranty on it. Um, we've actually done some studies where we, we actually have sensors working, uh, I think with this new platform, we're looking at 26 years for an infrared sensor to be working in, in, in the long haul. So I, um, I think back to the, the cat. They, and the other Jason are saying, because they, they've got a 10 year warranty on the IR sensor and then the pressure transmitter has a 10 year warranty. It sounds like if you buy our stuff, I'm basically out of a job for like 10 years. So just, just saying, anyways, Jason. Replacement ahead. parts are tough, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the product is great. We all love it, you know, no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah so, um, to keep you in a job, the only thing that can be detected by the cat bead sensor that the IR cannot is hydrogen. Um, that's still the only thing that can be detected um, okay. with, with, the, with that sensor. Hydrogen then. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and then if, we, if you're looking at, uh, go back one, one slide yet. Um, and then if you're looking at multiple hydrocarbon applications, the cat bead will give you a better linear output for the, the cocktail of gases that might, that might be there, while the infrared sensor is looking at one absorption peak. So even though it will detect all hydrocarbons, um, it'll be accurate for one and then kind of uh, be off or maybe overreact for the others because we generally, uh, well, that's our, our prudent side of being a safety company. We're going to recommend that uh, uh, the least absorptive gas would be the one detected while we alarm earlier for everything else in, in that in that scenario. Um, before you advance the slide, the last thing I want to mention is the IR sensor is considered fail safe. Because we're emitting a beam um, of infrared light, we're looking for that light on the anal analytical side. We can tell you if that if that light has failed, whereas the catalytic bead sensor, if it does fail, it'll fail at zero at zero percent LEL or four milliamps, right? So um, you only find out that that sensor has failed at calibration. Now you can advance. So where do these sensors go? They go into the Ultimate X5000. This is the new, the new platform. I believe Oxable has some Ultimate Xs. Um, those are going to be discontinued in June of 21. This is the new platform. Um, optical buttons, 
so no need for remote controls or magnets. Um, organic LED display, the, set, the status bars that you see in, in, in green on the side, the, in, the green is good, yellow for a fault condition, or if you're in alarm condition, those sidebar lights will turn red. Next. Just letting you know, Jason, got about five minutes, but you're doing great. Keep going. Yep. Did you say something about Bluetooth? Um, so, yes. Uh, so this this transmitter does have uh, a Bluetooth option. So with with Bluetooth, you can actually uh, check your live your live gas readings, modify your set points, uh, change your settings, do a do a do a calibration, um, and then in our estimate, you can reduce your setup time by not touching the face of the transmitter by using Bluetooth and save your time by 50%. Next. So this is an example of what a live gas screen, a live gas reading is. So if, when, when you're in, in the app, which is free on the Android or, or, or Apple Store, um, you can see your live, your live gas readings, your alarm points. If you're doing toxic gases, I know we didn't really touch on that on this presentation, but your, ID, uh, your IDLH and your PELs are, are there. Your sensor health is indicated. If you're an alarm, note on the right side, you can acknowledge your alarms if, if they're latching. Next. Um, here you can actually, this, this shows the, the calibration screen on the app. Um, we, didn't get, we didn't get to this part yet, but there's dual sensor technology on here, so you can put two sensors on one transmitter. Um, you can select what sensor you want to calibrate what type of calibration they, that, that you want to do, a zero or full calibration. Previous Ultima X users might be saying, hey, where's my iCal? There's no more iCal. Um, walks you through the whole, whole process. At the end of it, you get a Cal report, as found as left, next estimated Cal dates, and then your sensor health. If it's a, a cat bead or a toxic sensor, we give you a, a, a sensor health in, indication. Next. So other things that, that we can do with this, we have the safe swap, we have the Excel sensors, which I don't think we're really touching on on this one, and then the dual sensing technology. Next. Did you say dual sensing? I did. Oh, no, sorry, wrong slide. Um, same spot. Go ahead. It's that's coming. okay. That's okay. I knew it was coming. Um, this is an indication of the safe swap. If you're familiar with our Ultima Xs, this is a, a feature that, that came from that, that platform. Um, you can remove a sensor in in a hot condition, class one, div one environment, without a hot, hot work permit. When the sensor is removed from power, there's still enough threads connected to that sensor housing where we still meet area classification. And then putting a new sensor in is easy as a light bulb. Next. So we've talked about IR and 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 catalytic beat sensors, but here's a scenario where maybe you may have a toxic sensor or an infrared sensor paired together. You can have any combination of gases paired on this new platform. So the only restriction is um, for integrally mounted sensors, you can only have one IR sensor on the housing. That's really just based off of the weight of the IR sensor um, going through vi vibration testing with the approval agencies. Um, all sensors on this new platform have the same four wires for the sensors going to the transmitter. And then something else that's new is sensors can be remote mounted 328 feet away. Next. Um, really, we're rounding out to the end here. Um, I think I'm just going to be at, at time here. So we're on the Ultima X5000, you have two analog outputs, one for each sensor. You can have heart output is to the standard now. Um, and when you have two outputs on a transmitter, the industry standard is analog. The heart will write on the analog one, and then you have two alarm relays, one fault, um, and then we're coming up with some other uh, communication features shortly. We're going to have some wireless heart. We're going. We're coming up with a, a Modbus feature um, this year, and then we're looking at some other uh, communication protocols for the future, like. Field bus or maybe even Ethernet. And then, so Thank now you, you can Nathan. check for, for questions. Uh, we, we appreciate it. And I, I realize now uh, the meme was missing. There was a meme. There was a meme about yeah. two sensors, one transmitter. But 
We do also do flame detection, and I wanted to mention that last. Um, yeah, so the, what, as Jason was mentioning, you can put two sensors on one transmitter. I mean, this, this is a really simple concept, but it, it's really easy to remotely mount two sensors and have one transmitter. If you have a major project, that can save you a lot of cost because you have to buy half the transmitters. Um, and by the way, we also do flame detection. Um, yesterday, they, J, J, MSA did a video, a live stream, where they light, they lit some stuff on fire and then they showed their flame detector work. Um, so they're gonna do another one of those. Listen, when is that? Is that next Thursday? Uh, January 28th, we're having another live demonstration of our flame of our flame building and our flame okay. products. Yes. So not next, but the not next week, but the week after. Um, yeah, those are those are fun webinars to sit in on. So um, so thank you, Jason. I'm going to go back to really quick. I'm going to check our. I'm going to start a poll. What is your favorite feature of the X5000? So we have Bluetooth. We have two sensors, one transmitter. Uh, the sensor has a five-year expected life. And by the way, you can stock O2 sensors now. You can stock them on the shelf. Um, so that's something we can, we can certainly follow up with uh, the next time you guys are looking to purchase more, more O2 sensors uh, and possibly upgrade to the X5000. And boy, everybody's, everybody's all over the place. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of features here. So, and yeah, please tell us if you have another uh, thing about this sensor you like, tell us in the chat. I'm just going to show the results real quick. But I think you can all see them anyways. I'm going to check our Q&A. Let's see. What is TrueCal? Uh, Jason, can you describe TrueCal in an elevator pitch of one minute? I can. Uh, so TrueCal is what's on, our, on a couple of our toxic sensors, H2S and carbon monoxide. And TrueCal basically is a self-check function that adjusts itself to the electrolyte loss, temperature, and, and humidity changes of the environment. So every six hours, four times a day, it does what's called a true cal or a pulse check um, in, as you dive in a little bit deeper. And the sensor does a, a self-check, adjusts itself. If it can't adjust itself to maintain its calibration, it's going to al alert the user um, via the sidebar lights that we saw on the transmitter and say, hey, I need to be calibrated. If it fails TrueCal and the sensor cannot be calibrated, the, sen the transmitter will also let you know and send out a fault relay or drop a milliamp signal down and letting the user know every six hours if the sensor is good or bad. So every six hours, it's going to tell you whether or not it thinks something is wrong. Um, that's amazing. And that is not a replacement completely for calibration. It's not a replacement for it. but it gives you a lot more diagnostics and it does allow you to do things like stretch out that calibration cycle. If you usually calibrate quarterly, you know, it, it's possible, I can't speak for your application, but it's possible that you wouldn't have to do a quarterly calibration. Maybe it would be semi-annually or even annually. So those are all things. Yeah, we can with the, Go ahead. If, if, if I might interject with the, with the true cal function, you can actually, um, with just the pulse check function, you can go, we recommend a one year calibration interval. We didn't dive deep, but there's some other things that can make you go up to two years, a two year interval in calibration with, wow. and that's in particular for the H2S and the carbon monoxide. And perfect. And, and you know, it's working because it's, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Well, Jason, thank you very much. We have two more presentations and I am excited to talk to you, uh, to talk to Tim Roth and have him tell you about our new TDL. Now, when you think about PDL, typically you're thinking about two sensors, well, you, a sender and a receiver of a laser, and it's measuring some type of gas that's in a duct. You're trying to know what's the concentration of O2, percentage O2, things like that. It'll give you a very exact reading, um, but can be very expensive, and it's usually got that, that sender and receiver of the laser. But that's just TDL. We're here to talk about the TDL 8100S. And what is so special about Yokogawa's 8100S? It's a probe style TDL. Now, just in case anybody gets triggered, I followed up in an email with a Bernie meme, and now I'm doing a Trump meme. So I'm playing both sides. We're equal opportunity here. Um, Tim, thank you very much for joining us. Take it away. Tell us about it. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate it. I do have one issue, though. I've looked everywhere around the house on every door to the house, and I have not been able to find my lunch. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a, it checks in the mail, right? The checks yeah, in the mail. Yeah, I understand. That's the way it always is. Hey, good <laughs> afternoon, everyone. Um, Special good afternoon to Kevin down there. I uh, haven't seen you guys for a while. Still running around the area and everything. Um, this is a real fun topic for me, you guys, so I'm going to jump right into it. As Andrew said, new analyzer available. Go ahead, Andrew. The TDLS uh, 8100 is based on some very, very solid technology. Actually, we purchased a company back in 2008 called Analytical Sensors Incorporated when we introduced the our first TDLS 200. And as Andrew said, you needed a sender and a receiver. So we came out about three years ago with the TDLS 8000, the major upgrade to the 200 platform. Again, excellent progress. There's been a lot of things that we've done and a lot of things that we've done right. We have a huge installed base of these analyzers, a significant number in the combustion area. The whole pretense of the TDLS 8100 is to give you an analyzer that can be mounted on one flange. There's some process things we have to watch, and I'll go over those in a minute here. But typically what it's aimed at measuring right now, there will be additions in the coming months and years. Oxygen, CO, and methane is a combined analyzer, ammonia, or HCl. Go ahead. Well, just a quick review. We're, what's happening here? Well, what we're doing is we're relying on the fact that different molecules absorb a laser's energy at different frequency. I like to refer to it as dancing molecules. The stretching, the wagging, the movement, the jumping up and down of the bonds between the oxygen molecule or the uh, uh, methane molecule or the CO molecule. So different wavelengths of a light, different analytes absorb different wavelengths of light. Now, when we say tunable diode, it doesn't mean we can tune from the oxygen molecule, which happens to be absorbed at about 760 nanometers, to the CO molecule, which absorbs at about 2100 nanometers. Fact is, is the tuning is over about a half a nanometer band pass, not very wide. So when we say tunable, it's referring to the fact that we're staying on peak of a particular uh, molecule, in the case of oxygen, I'll keep picking on that, 760 nanometers. Go ahead. Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, did it come through? You did, it, it finally did. Uh, okay. Process conditions, unlike a TDLS 8000, which we typically see in a very large number of combustion applications, where we can handle up to 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit and pressures upwards of 290 PSI. This analyzer is limited by mechanics and the actual uh, uh, materials of construction. It utilizes a probe that has an optical path length total of about one meter. It's folded over on itself. We can handle velocities up to about 30 um, meters per second, but the limiter here that we really got to watch is temperatures up to 600 degrees C. Pressures, we can get relatively high on pressures and flow rates. We always want a little bit of flow with this analyzer. The reason we want a little bit of flow with this analyzer is we're going to bring flow at the bottom roundness of that probe, the bottom half of it, and we're going to basically push it up along the sides. And what will happen is gases will dump into that flow chamber that you see there. Well, there's a couple of holes on either end labeled entering process gas that are used to make sure that we're getting a constant turnover of gas. On the left, we have a mirror, but I have a detail on that. So go ahead, Andrew. Okay. The way we get a one meter path length on this is we have a, we utilize what's called a retro reflector. On the right, we introduce a laser beam through a window, through a process window. We go down to a retro reflector. All that is is a fancy name for a mirror, you guys. And what it does is it basically folds over on itself so we get one bounce of the actual laser. What this allows us to do is take that probe and put it into processes where we have a duck under that temperature limit of 600 degrees C, 
and we can put the probe into a duct that could be one meter, half a meter, excuse me, 0.7 meters or up to two meters in depth. Go ahead. Okay. It's the analyzer is completely modular, like our previous TDLS 8000. It has some really unique features. For example, the analyzer straight out of the box is SIL2 rated. SIL2 rated out of the box. Don't need two analyzers anymore to get a SIL2 rating. It has Modbus communication built into it. It has heart communications built into it. It has a significant history associated with it. The key is modular in design, able to be built and maintained, or excuse me, it'd be able to be maintained out in the field by you guys. Go ahead. Operator interface is what we call the YH-8000. The YH-8000 will communicate with either uh, TDLS 8000s or TDLS 8100s. Up to four TDLS analyzers can be handled by one operator interface. You see two analyzers being displayed on the display on the right. Go ahead. Onboard diagnostics. Significant amount of uh, attention was paid to putting onboard diagnostics to tell us the health of the analyzer. Is it operating properly? In the case of the oxygen and the CO laser, we'll actually put in a reference cell that will keep the laser locked on peak, especially if I'm, I'm approaching values of oxygen where it's approaching zero or zero values of actual CO. Go ahead. Installations, number of different directions. One of the things we have to know about is the direction of the flow of the hot gases, or even if they're cool gases. So you want to tell us this up front because we want to orient this thing properly as it ships out of the plant. One thing of interest here, in comparison to our TDLS 8000s, this analyzer comes to you pre-aligned, where TDLS 8000, you have to go through an entire alignment process. Go ahead. Various different lengths, as I've mentioned before, a 0.7 meter, a 1 meter, a 1.5, or 2.0. It's always the same optical path length, no matter what the length of the probe is. Go ahead, Andrew. Just letting you right. know, Tim, we have about five minutes left. Thank you, sir. Purge gases, you will have a number of purges that are going to be required for this analyzer. We do make a purge panel. That purge panel is called a support panel. That support panel is plug and play compatible with the analyzer. So the beauty of it is you order it from us and basically install it, you connect up your purge gases to it, you connect up your tubing and you start the analyzer up and put it online. Go ahead. This is what one of those utility panels looks like. This happens to be a dual analyzer. There's nothing really, really rocket science about this particular portion of it, the support panel. Again, the point is, is you get it from us as a complete package rather than having to piece things together. Go ahead. Coding a TDLS 8100 is just like the 8000. I need an application data sheet completed with the stream composition and do we have any dust particular and you know on the physical parameters nothing unusual here you guys go ahead applications go ahead we see them i mentioned combustion i see a lot of these analyzers used in the oxygen limiting applications where i'm looking to make certain that say a vessel is blanketed with nitrogen and I have no oxygen present because I'm worried about ignition of possible uh, contaminants are on top of that vessel. So a number of different places where we utilize these analyzers. Go ahead. Key points, thingo flange design, huge, you guys. No more issues with aligning the laser unit and the sensor control unit. It comes to you pre-calibrated and pre-aligned in situ averaging across that optical path reduces the number of um, um, the associated costs and time with maintaining the analyzer interference free and oh by the way cell two straight out of the box no need for two analyzers to get cell two that's really our tdls 8100 any questions anyone has 
Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, that was a great presentation. Just to reiterate your point, install is not that hard. With this one. Um, you can you can easily install it. You know, I, I, there's a lot of people where you've got a sensor and a receiver. Sender and receiver. I think I've got some uh, echo. Can somebody mute their microphone? Um, but in a lot of applications, the original TDL, you've got a sender and a receiver, and you have to align them just perfectly. If they're if they're off a little bit, it won't work. But this one, very simple to do so. And yeah, the package solution where you you pretty much buy it, sell to, and you've got everything you need. Um, it, it makes it a lot easier in terms of ordering and, and knowing you have the right equipment uh, when it goes to the install. Andrew, so. you hit it on the head. You know, we aren't going to get rid of the TDLS 8000 because it has some very good applications in various applications where our distances start getting over 17 feet to, you know, 94 feet is the greatest distance that I know across a process meter. But we're not going to get rid of it. It's just an enhancement to the product line. Mm -hmm. So I have a quick poll for everybody. Um, I have heard about a potential moisture treater application. And I was curious just how dry the gas is. Uh, I don't know if this is something. And obviously, this is a, you know, a, a ballpark of one to five stars. Uh, we're going to follow up with a little bit more on how dry we can measure. Um, and another thing before I let Tim talk a little bit about that is Tim Roth, just like Jason Pittman with Yokogawa, is also responsible for many products. Um, so we also do have things like zirconia sensors, uh, and Tim also handles the analytical uh, process, pH, ORP, DO, those kinds of things. Um, so Tim, yeah, this was an application that was brought to me just in brief conversation. Um, would it be an issue? How, how dry can we measure uh, using the TDLs? You know, I'm going to throw that back at, to get an application data sheet completed on it, Andrew, because it really depends on a number of different things. Are we trying to do the measurement in situ? Are we trying to do it under controlled conditions? Many times when we're trying to get real low range moisture measurements, we need to control pressure and temperature because those can have a significant impact. Now, while it's true, we typically do do temperature compensation to all TDLS analyzers. When you're dealing with moisture, say moisture in chlorine or moisture in a VOC or moisture in EDC, ethylene dichloride, things like that, then it comes into play that we're going to have to have pressure and temperature control. So I really defer that to getting a completed data sheet on that to give you anything, give you a real good idea. Thank you for that. Um, I, I've seen some pretty magical things happen with the TDL. Yes, and, sir. Uh, JM, JMI is is no stranger to gas anal and analyzers, um, so so we, we'd be we'd be happy to help you with that. Um, someone had a question on the on the molecules. Uh, they were they were just they just wanted a little bit more information on on all the different types of ways molecules can bounce around. And I'm just gonna just gonna quickly digress if this if my screen will sure. let me. Um, oh, it's taking its time. Yeah. Well, what, what it is? It was, it, was a, uh, it, it was mostly a joke, Tim. But we appreciate you you doing the presentation for this, um, guys. We have one more. We are almost through this thing. We have Carl Lang, and he's gonna make it hot. Uh, Carl Lang from Thermon is is gonna talk to us about all sorts of things so when you think of Thermon, you guys use their heat traits uh a lot you use their heat traits all over the place and their controllers but Thermon heats everything they don't just do heat traits. they don't just do that so Carl uh is going to join us Carl, take it away thank you well uh, thank you andrew and uh thank you everyone for uh, joining and letting us spend a little bit of your afternoon going over some of our products uh my name is carl lang i'm the regional manager for Thermon, and what i want to talk about is Thermon, uh, we're a lot more than just heat tracing today. Uh, we can offer a whole line of industrial process heating solutions and temporary power. Next slide, please. So just don't think of us as the uh, heat tracing guys. We do still do heat tracing. We sell a lot of it. We do heat tracing. We also do steam tracing. Uh, along with the uh, steam and electric heat tracing, we need tubing bundles for uh, sample lines and analyzers as well or sims uh, shelters we also do the temporary power solution i'll talk about that more later in the presentation we also do uh, all kinds of industrial process heating 
and environmental space heating. So we'll talk about that. So just don't think about uh, tanks or pipes or vessels or equipment. We also can uh, provide environmental space heating for uh, rooms or specific uh, applications where you're trying to prevent uh, freezing on certain lines or equipment. Um, we also do uh, gas catalytic heaters, not just electric or steam heaters, but we also do gas catalytic heaters. Uh, we do immersion heaters or circulation heaters. So we can do small immersion heaters to a, a, a thousand watts to we've done a large uh, electric circulation heaters up to one megawatt. So uh, anything and everything all in between. And we also do have a line of uh, transportation heating systems for rail heating and uh, switch heating. Um, you can go to the next slide. Some of the brands that we have, or you may or may not be familiar with, obviously the Thermon heat tracing, our catalytic uh, gas heaters for propane or natural gas, natural gas heaters is our Catadyne. It's a catalytic uh, heater. Uh, we have Kick that's an uh, oven. We also have Fast Track, which is our rail heating systems, 3L filters. We can also uh, manufacture uh, filtration as well as heating and filtration, totally engineered solutions. We have the Norseman, which is electric heaters uh, for panels or our area space heating. We have the Roughneck, which is steam and electric heating uh, for environmental space heating. And we have the Calorie Tech, which is process uh, heaters, could be inline heaters, could be uh, immersion heaters, uh, could be electric circulation heaters, or fully developed uh, engineering packages. Like I said, we do on uh, electric uh, circulation heaters. We've done them as large as one megawatt. Next slide. This is kind of the rough, just kind of give you, if you're not familiar with the Roughneck, it's a pretty well uh, known brand out there. Um, they are environmental space heaters for steam. We can do anything from um, essentially three kilowatts up to 35 kilowatts. We can do it in electric. So we can do anything from 208 to 600 volts. Uh, we have different materials, stainless steel, hair site coating, so we can meet your uh, different applications or area uh, requirements. Um, we also manufacture uh, inline uh, forest draft line heaters or duct heaters, as well as uh, advanced vertical heaters or horizontal heaters as well. You can go to the next slide. The calorie tech, this is where I talk about the process heating. We have, uh, again, forest draft heaters. We do have inline pilot uh, gas heaters, electric heaters. We can manufacture uh, engineered solutions or circulation heaters or uh, tank or immersion heaters. So we do inline heaters or immersion heaters. We can do that, uh, we do that electrically um, and we can cover the gamut of voltage requirements, one phase, three phase, single phase or three phase, you know, 120 volt to 600 volts or, or more um, for any specific heating application you may have for lines, what have you. Next slide. We have the Catadyne catalytic heaters. Uh, we do this for a lot, of, we use this in a lot of the um, uh, natural gas lines um, in like the Marcellus or Utica areas or up in Canada as well. Basically, this is a catalytic heater. Essentially what you do is you bring natural gas or pro propane in the heater. You start the chemical reaction. Once you start the chemical reaction, it'll run continuously and as long as you have gas and air, it'll keep running. So we can do this for environmental space heating. We also have a pre-manufactured enclosures or for regulator enclosures. Basically what we're trying to do is either keep a process from freezing or heat an environment like a, a small shed or an area, or we even do large facilities as uh, for some of the natural gas, we do them for large uh, transportation buildings where they have the, like the natural gas uh, busing systems and cities. Uh, basically, a lot of this, what this can do is prevent um, ice formation. It overcomes the Joule Thompson effects. So we can, um, anytime you have pressure reductions in natural gas, you have about uh, seven, um, per, uh, seven degrees temperature drop for 100 PSI in pressure drop in natural gas. So that can, uh, formate uh, icicles on your line or your equipment or your regulators. So what we do is use these catalytic heaters to go ahead and apply enough energy in that to prevent the Joule's Thompson effect or keep that process from freezing. And we do it everything from small, uh, a couple, 100 watts to 
We do inline heaters for like uh, border town trans, uh, transfer stations. We've done that to uh, a million BTUs per hour. Next slide. We also do have the 3L uh, filtration systems and we can do uh, fuel gas conditioning skids um, and any kind of filtration, maybe impingement, uh, what have you. So we do have a lot of different engineered solutions. We not only can supply the uh, filtration uh, system as well as the, um, the media for the filtration, but we also can provide the wells, uh, vessels as well. So we can provide this as an engineered solution um, for a particular application. Typically that's where our, our sweet spot is, is that if you have an application, what we can do is we have all the engineering resources to do that. We can put a full uh, engineering package together and provide the entire equipment. And we can also marry that with our heating system. So not only can we do filtration systems, we can do conditioning systems. And if heating's required, obviously we have all the capabilities for any requirements you need for heating that process. Next slide. We do have rail heating systems. We call our fast track systems. We have uh, the gas fired blowers that basically would keep uh, like switching uh, mechanisms or the rails themselves uh, heated. So you don't have a formation of ice or uh, it could impede the uh, operation of a switch if you're trying to uh, keep ice and snow off the switching mechanism so you can move the switching on the tracks. We can do it with a gas, uh, a gas fired blower, which is kind of looks like a flame. It's heat uh, on the switching or the rail or the next slide, we can actually apply cable or if you wanna move to the next slide, mm -hmm. we can do the um, heating right on the rail itself. And we can not only supply the heating, but we can also provide all the control systems. And that would be the same for all our products. Not only do we supply the actual heating element, we can actually have full integrated control systems as well. Moving on to the next slide, we have the, uh, you may or may not be familiar with the Thermon heating systems. Um, this is the heat tracing. We have, uh, obviously we have a full array of uh, heating cables. It'd be self-regulating power limited cable, constant wattage cable. Um, we can manufacture and we do manufacture them all and we supply them. Along with that, we also do steam products. So we have some unique products as far as our safe trace so that we can basically manage the, uh, the space or the deviation between uh, the high and low temperatures within a pipe when you're trying to do freeze protection or, or uh, process maintained so it doesn't get too cold or too hot. Uh, we also manufacture tubing bundles, which I met previous, mentioned previously. We can do that with steam or electric for uh, sample lines, analyzers, CEM shelters, and so forth. We also have fully integrated heat tracing control systems. I'm showing a little picture. You guys have a number of our controllers out there. This is our latest and greatest, our Genesis control system um, for heat tracing. Um, we do uh, manufacture all the, the heat tracing cables. Did you go back? Um, yeah, there you go. Um, so we do also do series application, but we do everything from uh, freeze protection to process maintain. So we can offer uh, cables for your uh, heat tracing uh, applications. We can also provide all the engineering design. So design and all the engineering deliverables, VB panel board schedules, heat tracing isometric drawings, equipment drawings, uh, power plot plans, and power distribution. You want to go to the next slide? Uh, we also have within our heat tracing systems, we have a full uh, integrated network solution. We call it our net, uh, Genesis network. We can offer wireless. Not only can we offer wireless our, uh, wireless between communication between the controllers, uh, we can also do wireless RTDs for uh, temperature mesh measurements. But the nice thing about our uh, new Genesis network is we have a fully integrated uh, wireless mesh networking capability. So we can do that with our legacy products like you have already out there all the way to our latest and greatest. The nice thing this, this is a self healing um, wireless mesh uh, network. And we also can bring that all the way back. And we do have a operational software and reporting and analytics software package um, that can not only do all the monitoring, but you can do all the configuration controls of your uh, heat tracing system, as well as collect a lot of data and do some analytics for preventative uh, maintenance 
or predictive maintenance and reliability. Go to the next slide. A little quick picture of our Genesis HMI. It's a fully integrated um, love touch to pass and touch screen for um, your heat tracing system. It gives you multiple screens. So you get, a, um, not only can you get a, a indication of what the health of your heat tracing system, but at the panel on the display, you can also get all your trending for temperature versus current for a, a day, a week, a month, three months, or six months. So you can do troubleshooting or some analysis of your heat tracing right at the panel. And you can also, within that screen, you can put all the engineering deliverables for each individual circuit. So if you're out in the field and you want to look at the uh, circuit number five, you can bring up the heat tracing isometric, the panel board schedule, the power plot plan, any documentation that you have for that heat tracing system that you can either troubleshoot or maintain that system, you can put it right there in the field. Go to the next screen. Next slide. We do make a variety of bundles as well. Um, and then we also do our Thermon uh, temporary power solutions. So we can do either a hazardous or non hazardous or gener general purpose uh, locations. Um, we can do everything from a main power distribution center to the remote distribution centers to plug and play panels to um, your area task lights and all the associated equipment. Um, and go to the next slide. Yeah. So thank you very much, Carl. Um, Thermon heats everything. They make everything. They don't just make heat trace anymore. And uh, we thank you guys. That was four presenters and they each did 15 minutes. So we, we've done, we've covered a lot in 15 minutes. But just to prove to you. Oh, you there, Carl? Yep, I'm here. Just to prove to you that we can do it faster, we can tell you everything we can do faster. JMI has some YouTube videos, and this is how we heat everything in 30 seconds. Oh. Heat everything. Here's everything we make hot in 30 seconds. We are a local supplier of heat tracing, but did you also know we do custom roofs? Steam tracing and tube bundles can also heat your plant by keeping gases hot until they reach their sample point. Temporary power systems can provide full packages of energy to meet the power needs of a major plant year-round. Our environmental and space heaters are awesome and carry readings for nearly every environment. Our immersion or circulation heaters are fully customizable. We can provide anything from a tubular element all the way up to a skid circulation heater. Finally, our rail car transportation heating can help clear the snow and heat the freight or the floor of a rail car. So that was everything Carl said in 30 seconds. And uh, before we get to the q and I'm curious what of this you guys use. Um, I, I think that we quoted recently, Carl, a circulation heater, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and I was curious, um, for, for those of you at Oxable, are you guys using this equipment? And if so, which stuff? I know you guys have a rail car. Uh, I'm pretty sure line heating would be something you could, you could use. I see people saying, well, we do use line heaters. Uh, Carl, can you mute yourself really quick? I'm just getting an echo. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, ask you to answer the questions in just a second. But thanks, Carl. So good to hear that you guys use the line heaters. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share those results. And I know that we are we are running low on time, so let's go right to the Q and A. I need to head out. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody has to head out, go right ahead. We are gonna go ahead and finish up here. Um, it didn't look like we have any questions. But uh, on behalf of all of the presenters today, thank you guys for attending. Um, here are your presenters in order of how they presented. And of course, thank you. Thank you, right? Thank you, you're too kind. You're too kind. Oh, stop it. Oh, I really appreciate it. Thank you guys, thank you. Oh, I'm always happy to be your presenter and uh, we're happy to follow up with any information you guys want on any of the products. Uh, so if you want more information, here is my contact info. Um, I'm going to stick around just a little bit and see if anybody wants to ask any questions in the Q&A well, now that we're done. Um, but thank you, thank you for attending, and I hope you enjoyed your lunch, and uh, we'll see you around. So thanks, guys. Great job to all the presenters. I'm just going to stay on for a second and see if there's any quick questions that come up. But it looks like people are logging off. So thanks guys, um, Tim, Carl, Jason, Jason, really appreciate it. I'm gonna shut this down, okay?
。はい。